In business today, three things to know. First, easing tensions, world markets respond to a possible ceasefire in Ukraine, but whether it's real or not depends on who you ask. Then, Americans ran to the showroom and drove out with new cars this summer. U.S. auto sales blew past expectations. What's driving the comeback? And are you ready for some football? The NFL money machine gears up as the league tries to stiff arm some recent controversies. Arise Exchange starts now. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Schmertz. Americans took the road to the showroom last month as U.S. auto sales posted better than expected month over month gains. The industry is actually poised to reach volumes last seen before the recession. Ford posted gains of 0.4 percent. That's compared to a loss forecasted by analysts. Chrysler, which is now owned by Fiat, posted a 3.8 percent gain, nearly double what was forecasted. And General Motors was the lone disappointment, reporting a sales drop of 1.2 percent. And auto sales helped the overall U.S. economy. This afternoon, the Fed released what's known as the Beige Book Survey, which measures economic activity. The economy showed modest improvement over the past six weeks. And factory orders jumped in July. The Commerce Department says new orders for manufactured goods increased by a record 10.5 percent. The market started the day higher with news of a ceasefire between Ukraine and Russia, but by the end of the day, finished mixed. Here are the final numbers. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closed up 11 points to 17,078, but the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq both finished in the red. Some of the stocks we're watching today. Drugstore chain CVS Caremark stopped selling all tobacco products today. That's a month earlier than initially reported. CVS also decided to change its name to CVS Health. Probably the same reason they stopped selling tobacco products. CVS closed up 63 cents to 80.36. Apple shares fell nearly 5% today. That follows yesterday's news that naked celebrity photos were stolen off its iCloud service. And it's a week ahead of the new iPhone launch. Apple closing down 436 to 98.94. And the rich just keep getting richer. Billionaire investor Carl Icahn has reportedly sold his entire stake in Family Dollar stores, pocketing $200 million on the investment. Family Dollar closing up a penny to 80.23. Taking a look at commodities, gold up 5.80 and oil up 244 to 95.32. Peter Cardillo is the chief market economist at Rockwell Global Capital, and he is here back on Arise Exchange. Peter, welcome back to Arise. And I want to talk to you about these auto sales. Um, the analysts say this was a, a spectacular report, but it was kind of a single-digit fraction percentage gains for most of this. What do you read into it? Well, I, you know, it's a good report. There's no question about it. And I think the reason for it is that, you know, um, we had some real good weather. And besides the good weather, we had uh, uh, we still have uh, low interest rates, you know. And uh, so uh, people are out there buying cars, taking, taking advantage of this. And, you know, I think... Uh, most people realize that uh, uh, there will be a change in monetary policy uh, sometime next year. Uh, and that means interest rates are headed higher. And so uh, people are taking advantage of this. You know, I actually asked uh, about this yesterday. When you look at what's going on in Europe, doesn't this give the Fed some cover to keep interest rates lower maybe than they initially thought? Well, look, you know, look at the economic indicators. And, you know, I... I know you touched on the Beige Book before, and certainly the Feds came out and said, look, that there's, we still have moderate growth, but growth is beginning to, you know, uh, propel higher pretty much across the board. And I don't want to consider the growth factor that we're in now moderate. I think we're in a solid recovery. Mm -hmm. And so um, even though there is no real threat of inflation uh, on, 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 on the horizon, uh, which includes uh, wage inflation, which would really be the kicker. And that's what they continuously yeah. look at. I mean, there's no question that, that that's still far, far away. So I, I kind of think, you know, um, what's happening in Europe has to do more with a lot of uncertainty that revolves around what the markets actually uh, rose uh, uh, this morning on was a, 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 a possible truce possible between Ukraine truce and Russia. Between and, Russia. That, and that changes and, day to day, right? So we don't, yeah, we don't yeah, really know. Yeah. So I think that has, is having a real psychological effect on Europe, not so much here in the States. Okay, I want to get back to the auto sector for a moment. How much of this was low interest rates and the fact that people did not buy cars for about a decade or so? The average age of a car on the road was apparently near historic highs. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just got rid of a car from 2001. Yeah. Well, and it had to be towed away. 
obviously, right, but <laughs> obviously you don't you don't lease, and 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 the, and the big right. story in the car market has been leasing. Yep. I mean, you know, people go out and uh, have short-term contracts of three three and a half years, so they're out there constantly buying new cars. Now, uh, there's that other group who don't believe in that and still want to buy, uh, you know, and, and own a car, um, and, and, and that relates to the low interest rate. Okay. Uh, for the market, are we looking at a September swoon historically? The first question is, is it really have any real importance to look historically what months do with the markets? And if so, September tends to be a month where you see a Yeah, pullback. September ha is a murky month and sometimes can uh, introduce uh, uh, some negative surprises. So far, uh, we haven't seen that. Um, do I think that the market is headed for some sort of a technical pullback? Yes, it's overbought. Uh, I think that we could wake up one day and see a, a technical reversal. The technical re reversal could be anywhere from uh, 3 to 5 percent. Uh, but not I a 10 percent correction. No, I don't think and so. And certainly think, not with the doomsayers I, are out no, there, which no, is like a 25 percent correction. I think, no, I, I think we're, we're still months away from that happening. Uh, but in the short term, the market is definitely overbought. Why do you say the market's overbought, though, when you look at the fundamentals? Well, the fundamentals are good, but, you know, look what's really happening in the marketplaces. Uh, many stocks, especially uh, in the mid-cap arena, are not moving that very much. And it's just a handful of stock that are in the indices that are propelling the indices higher. And I think that, uh, you know, at one point that it calls for an overbought situation because it's a handful of stocks that are moving up. It's not a market, it's not a stock of markets, but individual stocks. Okay, interesting. Peter Cardillo, thank you. Talk to you soon. My pleasure. Coming up, a preview of the NATO summit and all that is on the alliance's plate. That's a lot. You are watching the Rise Exchange. Global. It's Monday, so it must be time for a new round of sanctions against Russia. Nigeria is open for business, and you are getting a handle on this situation. Compelling. Time for liquid lunch, things that make us want to drink. Could she have been separated at birth from, say, Grimace? All business. Money's coming out of these countries, and that flow is part of what's driving the equity markets. Entertaining money, Dale. It's about reimagining. A rise exchange. News can definitely be improved when reflecting diversity. A lot of mainstream news, they, they don't dive into it. Who wants to hear about negativity all the time? They only show what you what they think people want to know and not what people really should know. World-based stories, that's what I enjoy the most. I think uh, diversity of news is important to the world so that everybody will be aware of their surroundings and what is happening today. Arise News, every culture, every angle. Tomorrow, the most important NATO summit since the fall of the Berlin Wall commences in Newport, Wales, hosted by U.K. Prime Minister David Cameron. Russia's adventures in Ukraine will, of course, dominate the summit, but there are a lot of other pressing issues. Arise News Washington Bureau Chief James Blue is en route to Wales, but decided to stop by here on Fifth Avenue first to talk with us. We thank you, James. Makes sense. Uh, this, this summer, the world either became much more dangerous or we finally woke up and realized how dangerous the world is. NATO has a lot to talk about here. Uh, how much of what they're going into do you think has caught them off guard that they're playing catch up? Well, I think NATO is really playing catch up and certainly playing catch up with the announcement today that President Putin believes there could be a peace deal and a ceasefire between Russia and Ukraine. Clearly, there's not going to be a ceasefire. <laughs> Clearly, this is a play to sort of get out ahead of what NATO does. But I think what has happened is the world is a complicated place. Mm -hmm. It continues to be more complicated. And we're sort of seeing that coalesce as these leaders gather from 28 nations in Newport, Wales, to try to deal with it. NATO, of course, is a military alliance, but much of their might really goes to economic sanctions these days, because that's probably the only way they could deal with Russia. So what do you think is going to come out of the summit when it comes to sanctions, especially when you're looking at Europe back in a recession? 
Right. Well, clearly NATO is a military alliance, and one of the things that's just been uh, announced, it looks like France, which was planning to, which was planning to sell a warship to uh, Russia, a uh, aircraft carrier, they've canceled that sale. So that is a complete military uh, consequence to Russia's actions. Clearly, the EU is lining up additional sanctions. The chances of them passing, I think, are particularly good given that Russia continues these forays into Ukraine. And Putin's comments don't help when he was caught off guard saying we could take Kiev in two weeks. Right. And the fact that he said that publicly, that it's out there, people recognize their, the threat remains. And so I think you will see an effort by the NATO countries and the EU, which is at the core, to try to do something. Uh, what is President Obama's goal, do you think, during this trip? Because he has a significantly more on his plate, obviously. Uh, where does he want to be seen coming out of this? Well, he wants to see support for whatever happens in Afghanistan. He wants to try to come up with some sort of movement and some type of uh, coalition effort against ISIS. President Barack Obama could really use this summit to try to emerge as the world leader that everyone wants him to be. It'll be very interesting to see if he has the real stamina and might to do that, because there are a number of issues that require world leadership, and people are really looking to him. Ukraine wants NATO membership. Do they get it? Ukraine wants NATO membership. I think it is. it was sort of more likely last week than it is this week. The fact that Russia has uh, further moved into Ukraine makes it much more dicey. Um, as you know, the, the uh, NATO charter uh, requires if any NATO country is attacked... Everybody, they're all attacked. They're all attacked. And so given... So the, they're certainly not going to take on a member that's now going to require them to live up to it. No, I, I, I think Ukraine's membership into NATO is certainly on pause. Mm -hmm. I think they, NATO will try to do everything possible to give uh, Ukraine what it needs, but I don't think we'll see membership this round. Okay, you mentioned ISIS as well, which has actually pushed the Israeli Hamas issue sort of to the back burner right now. What can NATO do and what does the president want NATO to do about ISIS? Because, because the British certainly might want to act alone. They won't. Uh, we discussed this in the office earlier. But there's a lot of pressure here. There's a lot of pressure here, and the, and the pressure really is that um, ISIS, if you look at it, is the remnant of al-Qaeda in Iraq. And basically what I think the president is going to try to do is to sort of show people what an untamed al-Qaeda can Not do. Not just the uh, al-Qaeda, but it's also Saddam Hussein's former army. Absolutely. The Sunnis have sort of rallied around and sort of decided this is their best way to try to exert some control both in Iraq and Syria. So he's going to use the ISIS model to kind of gather support for what he wants to do in Afghanistan, but he also wants to really create a international coalition to stomp out ISIS, which would mean trying to move and do something in Syria and Iraq more than what we're doing now. Okay, James, we will look forward to your reports from Wales starting tomorrow tomorrow. Okay, James Blue, thank you. Thank you. Time now for our business ticker stories making headlines across the nation and the world. Yesterday, you know, we told you about Atlantic City's struggling gambling industry with two more casinos, the Showboat and the Revel, closing its doors. Well, today, thousands of those newly laid off casino workers began filing for unemployment. An assistance center at the Atlantic City Convention Center expects to process 5,000 workers in the next three days alone. The annual ranking for the world's most competitive countries is out, topping the list released by the World Economic Forum is Switzerland. By the way, that's where the World Economic Forum is also based. Switzerland has retained its crown as the most competitive economy for the sixth straight year in a row. Switzerland is followed by Singapore, then the United States, which moved up two spots from fifth position last year, thanks to improvements in the U.S.'s financial markets and institutions. Halliburton announcing it has reached a $1 billion oil spill settlement deal. The company provided the cement used to cap the well that failed and led to the BP Gulf of Mexico spill in 2010. According to Halliburton, the agreement shields it from damages associated with the commercial fishing industry that was a result of the spill. And hundreds of artifacts owned by civil rights icon Rosa Parks have a new home. Years after legal battles began, a foundation run by Howard Buffett, the youngest son of Warren Buffett, has bought the items. Included among the items, her congressional gold medal, a signed postcard from Martin Luther King, and a trove of personal letters and notes. Parks died in 2005. Tax collectors in Colorado did not get the high they were hoping for from pot sales. The state is short some $21 million in estimated sales tax revenue it was hoping to get when it legalized marijuana for recreational use. Why? Well, it turns out that potheads like to buy their weed from illegal dealers in order to save the 27% tax. 
Robert Culkin is the CEO of the Cannabis Career Institute, which trains people to work in the marijuana industry. Robert, welcome back to Rise Exchange. That's great to be here. Uh, what do you make of all of this? Because the talk was that Colorado was going to get $33 million in tax revenue in the first six months of the year, and that was going to spur on other states to legalize marijuana simply for the money, but they're missing the mark by a wide range. Why? Well, aside from kind of overestimating how much they were going to get just to get the law passed, I think that the diversity of product is an issue. Uh, aside from the fact that the average Joe isn't going to spend his extra dollar unless he's going to get something extra for it. Um, I think the quality issue is really what we're talking about here, because if you can get the same quality on the street and it's less, then that's pretty much where you're going to go. So does this suggest that there's not more or, let's say, new marijuana smokers who are going to join in because the product's now legal? Rather, they're the same marijuana's uh, users before who's simply going to buy it from the black market because there's not a huge penalty to pay. Correct. And, and there's not much incentive to pay extra if they're not getting a, a greater quality of product. You know, if you go to a, any liquor store or wine store, they've got a great diversity of products from all over the world and people have a lot to choose from and they can special order it. So it seems to me as if it's it's a very limited market uh, since the marijuana can only come from Colorado. And so uh, all those stories we saw about the marijuana brownies and all the specialty stores popping up, sort of a flash in the pan, not making much of a difference? Well, I think that's a, a great example of where the market's going to go, which is going to be in products that are not for smoking. They're for vaporizing and for edibles. They're for tinctures and oils. And, and all of these things have to come from a supply that's consistent and of high quality. And again, the market hasn't been prepared for this uh, demand, and so they have kind of subpar products that they need to now uh, improve, and it, that's what they're doing. Is there a supply-side pot argument that if they lowered the tax down from 27 percent, they might actually increase the revenue? Is there any evidence that suggests a lower tax will get more people into the legal shops? Well, definitely. Uh, the, the average Joe, as I said, is being disenfranchised by these higher taxes and, is, and can't participate even if he wants to. So if you've got you know, a certain uh, percentage of, of the market that just can't uh, participate, then of course you're going to have a lower income than expected. And I've got to ask you, does this really bode poorly now for the argument of legalizing marijuana elsewhere? There's always been the argument that we're losing the drug war. That's fine. But there's no greater incentive for states than collecting money. And when other states see what looks like a tax failure in Colorado, they may be more hesitant, don't you think? Well, no, I just think that the, the laws need to be loosened up a little bit so that the market can a act as a free market should. It's, it's got to have less restrictions. It's got to have natural economic growth and natural com competition. Um, and we're not seeing that here. So it's kind of stagnant. And if we could just open up uh, some of the possibilities that these uh, dispensary owners have, they'd have a greater diversity of product and they'd have more customers. And what do you mean by that? What do you want to see as far as a greater diversity of product? What do you think that should be done in that well, arena? For now, we're only allowed to obtain it from within the state and we're only either allowed to grow it ourselves or get it from a limited amount of, of private growers. I feel that the market should... Uh, demand that uh, any kind of uh, business relationship that's legal should be able to happen. So in other words, a private grower should be able to supply a dispensary uh, and they should be able to get product from other states, which we cannot do now. Well, you, you can't do that, though, because of the federal laws as well, plus right. other states that's, having legalized it, right? So Colorado sort of stuck. Until we can have some kind of more diversity, we're going to be limited, and therefore it's going to limit the amount of tax that's coming. Okay. Robert Culkin, the CEO of the Cannabis Career Institute. Thank you, as always. Thank you. Coming up, do you want sex with your coffee? Our favorite person of the day is next. You're watching a Rise Exchange. One of my favorite moments on the show was interviewing the author Taya Selassie. She wrote the New York Times bestseller, Ghana Must Go, and she actually coined the phrase Afropolitan. And I feel like in part what this show speaks to is the Afropolitan audience. They're African, they're traveled, they're cosmopolitan, they're interested in the diaspora. That's what we deliver here. And Taya in many ways was the perfect embodiment of what I want our viewer to represent. 
I believe that people are watching news less today, definitely. I think that more so people are going online to catch their news. We've um, numbed the human mind to murders and all these bad things. The content is uh, a constant loop of the same stuff. So there needs to be, you know, new content all the time. Arise news, every culture, every angle. Welcome back to Arise Exchange. If you join the regulatory police state, you better be prepared when the tables are turned. That's the story of a Florida man who tried to shut down his neighbor's lemonade stand arguing that it was an illegal business. 61-year-old Doug Wilkie had contacted officials from the city of Dunedin numerous times complaining about the lemonade stand operated by his 12-year-old neighbor, saying he was not licensed and the lemonade stand reduced his property value somehow. The city concluded that they weren't going to go after a 12-year-old and let him keep his stand, but they then turned their attention to Wilkie himself. Turns out he uses his home to run his business, and he doesn't have a license to do that. So now the city of Dunedin may end up finding him each day that he's been operating in violation of the law. As for the lemonade stand, since word got out, business is said to be booming. And that does take us to our favorite person of the day when we pick one person who grabbed our attention and not for the right reasons. Today, it is the owner of the Java Jugs coffee shop in Seattle for selling more than just a cup of hot joe. Carmela Panico has pleaded guilty to offering a daily dose of caffeine and sex to her customers, earning hundreds of thousands of dollars in tips for her baristas. According to police, Panico owns several coffee shops named Java Jugs and Twin Peaks, not exactly subtle, and exchange tips from customers for her, her employees showing off their breasts and engaging in various sex acts. Get this, some baristas made $30,000 a month. That's a little better than what Starbucks pays. Here's how police say it worked. Customers would pay $6 for a cup of coffee and then an additional $14 tip if the barista showed her breasts. As part of a plea deal, Panico had to give up all her coffee shops, and she now faces a year in jail. So for giving her customers a little extra jolt with their coffee, Carmela Panico is our favorite person of the day. Coming up, how does your football team look this year? We'll preview the NFL season. One of the great things about Arise News, it is truly a multicultural global channel that is paying attention to communities of all different kinds, not just here in the United States, not just in Africa, but all around the world. As we're giving a voice to the people that don't traditionally have the kind of a voice that a mass media organization can have. You're getting here at Arise News that you're not going to find at the other networks is a unique perspective. And I think that's part of what Arise is here to do. Arise serves underserved communities by bringing them news, information, sports, and entertainment from places that are becoming part of the world economy, that are becoming a part of the world voice, and decisions that are affecting things in the world that people care about. They care about the economy. They care about safety and security. And if you come to Arise and you watch our broadcast, these are the things we're going to bring to you every day, 24 hours a day. The National Football League's regular season kicks off this week, and experts say the teams will generate more than $9.7 billion in revenue this season alone. But who's really footing the bill? Tickets to attend a home game for the Super Bowl champion Seattle Seahawks average more than $300 a game. Here to give us a breakdown by the numbers is DailyNation.com sports editor Mike Baco. Mike, welcome back to Arise Exchange. $300 to go see Seattle. Uh, they did win the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. so uh, they're going to get the prices? I think so. Seattle is one of those home stadiums where the TV market doesn't have to worry about a blackout. They're going to be there in force. They're one of the few home field advantages now in the NFL. So many stadiums now have become homogenized and skyboxed out and pricing out those fans who could barely afford the $100 ticket, never mind the $300 ticket. You know, we saw that here in New York, though, when the Jets and Giants had something called the personal seat licenses. Absolutely. And you had to basically buy the PSL 
and then buy the tickets, yep. and it was not hugely successful. Not hugely successful, certainly not hugely popular in terms of fans. You had to pay like $80,000. You have to pay forty to $80,000. Even seats way up top. You're looking at $20,000 just to st sit way up top for a jet team or a, a giant team. team. Yeah. The Giants that, I could see. The, the, Jets, uh... <laughs> but, but, but generations of fans being priced, priced out, out of, never of, of tickets. And football is one of those sports that, yes, billions of dollars coming in through TV. But what they're watching is the lifeblood of what's going on in the stadium. You want that good fan experience to watch on TV. Uh, the NFL had a lot of off-season news. Much of it they probably regret. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, now you have Wesley Walker getting suspended because of PED use. He's getting suspended longer than if he had assaulted his girlfriend, which mm -hmm. is part of the controversy with the NFL. Can the NFL move past these? There was some calls for the commissioner to even get fired. I think some of those calls are coming from the players. This is a very unpopular commissioner, upwards of $40 million in salary last year. But you look at it from the other standpoint, he has helped raise the revenue by billions and billions of dollars. That money is being funneled back into their salaries. But it certainly hasn't been a good year. But to your question, can they overcome it? This time last year, all anyone was talking about were concussion lawsuits and mm -hmm. settlements. NFL was very easily able to move past that once the games were able to start, obviously, into the it Super does, It does seem that way, that the fans are rather mercurial, meaning during the season they just want to watch football mm -hmm. and they will forget about the concussions. And, you know, I watched this documentary, great documentary on Joe Namath that's on HBO. Mm -hmm. And, boy, he got just clocked all the time, and he's clearly suffering ramifications from mm -hmm. it. But during the, the games... In the season, you don't hear much about this. No. People want to watch the games. They want to wa play their fantasy football. They want to gamble on the games. It's, it's more than just sports fans. It's become an institution. It goes beyond just the Super Bowl. 48% of fans that are watching the games on TV are females. So this is not just... They've, they've attracted a lot of, it's a lot just, of women. It's not just... And, and by the way, for the television industry, this is still one of the few sports that remains appointment viewing television on a national level with Monday night yep. football with now Thursday night football mm -hmm. you can't TiVo football games you can't TiVo football games at baseball as great as it is it's 162 games there are great opportunities to watch some national games but football is the opportunity that when you come in on Monday morning how did your team do how did your fantasy team do it's the one time when everyone is watching the same thing uh, Michael Sam uh, has signed with the Dallas Cowboys mm -hmm. to be on their practice um, squad uh, how big of a story does he continue to be? I think the fact that he was signed to the practice squad of the Dallas Cowboys, obviously one of the marquee franchises, makes it a little bit of a bigger story. But until he actually gets out onto that field, that's when the story is going to become really national. Dallas Cowboys coach uh, Jason Garrett was kind of tired of getting questions like, why are we talking about a practice player mm -hmm. after all of this? So I think it's going to die down a little bit until he makes it onto the field. Uh, the San Francisco 49ers are playing a brand new $1.3 billion high-tech stadium. Yeah. Why do municipalities continue to spend money on stadiums that never return the investment? They never return the investment. They're a, a shining jewel that they could point to and then gets used eight times a year, <laughs> ten times a year. This will be more multi-purpose. And, and by the way, in, in, in a, in, and I love football, but that is a profit-making, a hugely successful profit-making business that is also one of the most publicly subsidized industries in this country. A absolutely. You look at the rash of new stadiums that have been built. We talked about the Jet and Giant, mostly pr public, fi uh, private financed, I should say. But you look all around, and it's almost a hostage situation uh, in Oakland, year after year, talking about moving. It looks like they're going to have a new stadium, mostly private funded, but with $120 million in, in tax write-offs. So it, it's a dicey situation when you look at how much money is being funneled in and how much money they're taking. Uh, I have to ask you about the Washington Redskins because this is another what I call off-season story. We mm -hmm. hear all the controversy regarding the name, and then everybody in Washington shuts down mm -hmm. the streets on Sunday afternoon to see the Skins play. Absolutely. Uh, has there been any movement on changing the name? The Washington professional football team, as it may be known uh, on some broadcast, you, you have some big name uh, analysts, Phil Simms, Tony Junji, saying that they will not refer to the Washington Redskins name. Some ESPN personalities have said the same thing. So this may be a story that we're going to be seeing 
in season if announcers it, it outwardly does, it, are not referring to them as the Redskins. it does seem that Redskins. there is some momentum, usually in a story where there's some momentum going in a direction, it's often hard to beat that back. It is, but if you're Daniel Snyder and you've been beating back the critics for decades now of bad stewardship and ownership yeah, of the yeah, Redskins, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he, he, he could keep going. The team is a lousy team to it's, begin it's, with. It's a lousy team, but but he is, this is he's dug his heels in on this one. I don't think they're going to change the name. Okay, Mike Bako, we'll have you back during the season, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Tomorrow on Exchange, the nation's fast food workers gear up for a second round of strikes. And what impact, if any, will it have on the economy? Let's take a look at the markets once again. Dow Jones Industrial Average, uh, slightly in the green. The S&P 500 and NASDAQ, both in the red. I'm Andrew Schmertz. Thanks for watching Arise Exchange. We'll see you tomorrow.